Hi, everyone. Hi, Georgia. Hi. Hi, how are we doing? Can you hear us well? Yeah, can you hear me? Well, I'll leave, yeah, we can hear you very well. I'll leave the floor to you, and I'll tell you in Italian, Felici di averti. <laughs> Grazie mille. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited about this, even though I was, I obviously would have loved to be there in person, but you know, uh, this is what we need to do. Uh, so my name is Georgia. I don't see myself. I don't see you. I only see my slides. So I, you know, I hope that everything is okay. Um, but let's get started. Uh, my name is Georgia Luffy. I define myself as an information designer. Uh, and that means that every day with my team, I shape and design different ways my clients and their clients act is different type of information and particularly in my case data so data that can be qualitative quantitative big and small data that organizations already have or actually most of the times crafted by myself and my team in collaboration with our clients and data that we then represent visually translating numbers into images through data visualizations but also through building interactive experiences with these visualizations and so my work with data is very particular and visually driven. And uh, to give you a sense, I will play a montage of the work that I've done in the past nine years with the company that I co-founded previously, Acura, and where I was the design director up until last year, uh, before really getting into the core of what I want to talk about today. Um, and the images you will see, in the images you will see, obviously every color, size, position, and animation of the elements are direct representation of data points. talk about, I want to give you a quick idea of the type of projects you can work on from a data-driven perspective as a designer, but also on the other way around on the type of data project that you can approach from a design perspective. So for example, in the past year, we spent from working with newspapers and magazines. This preview that you're seeing is a very early collaboration with the Sunday cultural supplement of Corriere della Sera, the main Italian newspaper. I'm Italian, but I moved to New York eight years ago, where from 2012 to 2014, we designed more than 40 data analysis and visualizations. So every week we would go uh, and look for data on a main topic, combining and overlaying different type of information on cultural and social phenomena with many layers of context. And and then we produce data visualizations, but probably not the visualization you would expect on a national newspaper. We visualized every week uh, the data that we were working on with a unique language that has been crafted and created specifically for the data stories that we found with a legend that always accompanied the visualization, as you can see from these reviews. Completely different type of projects to working with clients like IBM, where in 2017, we instead designed a system of guidelines for all their data products or the data visualization. First of all, guidelines on how to work with data visualization effectively on a daily basis. So you start seeing that we produce, this is an interactive guide of the do's and don'ts with data, of all the things that their engineers and web designers should know about how to treat data effectively. But also, and most importantly, guidelines that could translate the great design heritage that IBM has built over the years in how they work with data. So guidelines that would make their chart look and feel like IBM, taking a clear visual inspiration from IBM's material from the past, even venturing into looking at physical objects, part of the IBM tradition to translate into data visualization concepts. So again, you see a completely different type of project to environmental experiences with data. This is an installation that we designed for the Milan Triennale. Uh, the Triennale was called, Triennial was called Broken Nature at the Design Museum in Milan. Um, 
where we created a data wallpaper for what we call the room of change with a legend in the middle for people to explore what this means. It's a data tapestry that flows uh, on a timeline from left to right, and it illustrates our multiple aspects of our environment have changed in the past century, how they're still changing, and how they'll likely continue to change. In this case, through a number of global data set that was sketched to put together the exhibition on nature, society, technology, and science, as well as single and specific contextual stories, such as the disappearing of the Lake Corral for climate change, so that can people relate, where these tiny incremental intervals over time, every vertical stripe that you see here is one year, can really show us how things change slowly, and you can only see them if you squint your eyes back. Uh, and again, with the legend to invite visitors to discover this world of change. To creating even more physical experiences um, and installations with data, this is the recent Starbucks Research Roastery that opened in Milan. And we designed a data visualization card in this big brass wall, the one that you see on the left in this image. Now it's just you know straight enough for you to see. So a data visualization um, in this big brass wall using carving and different etching techniques and perforation and lightning to represent different data points. In this case, depicting the timeline of the history history of the brand. In the background, we have the coffee making process. And if you squint your eyes, everything that is lighted up is a map of the world of the most important places for the Starbucks history. And in this case, an app that can be also experienced through an augmented reality mobile app that we design and develop to brings this data to life, adding a digital layer that interacts directly with the physical space of the wall. And مرحبا بكم مرة أخرى ودي أن أشرح لكم أكثر بس ما عندي أي فكرة إيش بتكلم عنه فاصل قصير ممتاز thank you thank you thank you جورجيا thank you oh sure can I go ahead yeah, so recently, before last summer, I joined Pentagram, which is the biggest independent design firm in the world, as a partner um, um, in their New York office. And we are 25 partners globally. We are, I am their ninth partner in New York. We have offices in London, Berlin, and Austin as well. This is a picture of us at our last uh, in-person global gathering. And Pentagram for me is an incredibly exciting place because my partners way before I joined have significantly contributed in shaping our collective visual culture for almost the past 50 years, at least you know, in the US and in Europe, um, forming our relationship with brands and the products and with our built environment through brand identity projects, through signage and wayfinding, environmental graphics, really visually branding many of the iconic places that we walked by every day and ultimately visually shaping a piece of our relationship with society. And joining Pentagram for me means to further my practice and try to integrate the language of data into even more mundane experiences, into what we wear, we consume, we see. Because what is data? So for many of us, data might feel not so connected with real life and you might even have a nebulous and um, vague meaning, often associated only with numbers, technology and algorithms, seen as scary and complicated and mostly cold and inhuman. But there is another approach to what we so coldly call data that I've always interested me more which is the fact that data is always, to always remember that data is an abstracted representation of reality and therefore a lens, a filter that we can use to see our world through any aspect of our world and our human nature and society one subject at a time. And then a narrative material to base design experiences on because it's only through seeing this data represented visually that our human brain can actually grasp and capture and understand them. And what I'll be talking to for the rest of the time together is about the data we don't see. So the data that are not already in form of a spreadsheet, in form of data, but they're the ones that, in my opinion, are the most interesting ones if we want to uh, unveil hidden patterns of our lives and the ones that can really unlock the potential of data to tell very human and relatable story. And you will see what I mean. 
I'll start with a very radical experiment where no technology was involved. Uh, it was a self-initiated project, so no clients here, that after years of working digitally, if you've seen before, and after years of working with quote unquote big data, reconnected me to the very nature of data. It's called Dear Data, and it's a collaboration with London-based designer Stephanie Pozovic. So Stephanie and I met only twice in our lives where we decided to run this very strange experiment around one main question. Is it possible to get to know another human being through data only? So for Dear Data, every week and for one year, we use our personal data to get to know each other. Personal data around weekly shared mundane topics from our thoughts and ideas to our activities, our most intimate feeling, our belongings, our desires. So 52 excuses in form of data to really investigate and reveal aspects of our self and about our days. Personal data that they will manually hand drawn on a postcard side sheet of paper that every week was sent from London to New York where I live and from New York to London when Stephanie leaves for one year. The front was always a data drawing, so you know, no explanation at all. Hopefully you want to just take it as a beautiful illustration if you didn't know that there was data behind it. And the back of the card contained, of course, the address of the other person and the legend, how to interpret our drawing. So Stephanie and I connect, collected our data manually to force us to focus on the nuances that computer cannot gather, or at least not yet, uh, using data to explore our minds and not only our activities and getting insights on the things that really matter the most to us. For example, in week number three, we tracked the thank yous we said and received, who they were and from and for, what they were about, if, if it was really meant or really just a courtesy thank, as you can see in this very over-detailed uh, legend in the back. And, you know, in this example, by looking at my week through the lens of this particular layer, I realized that I thanked most of the people that I didn't know very well, but kind of didn't thank enough the people who were close to me. And so we started to look at our days through data, such as in this case where I mapped my complaints, borrowing a very literal visual inspiration from the music notation system to show the repetitiveness of my complaints over time. But not only quantifying the numbers of times that I complained, instead really all the time adding context and details about why, what was happening, what was the situation, what was the feeling. So then realizing week after week how to put ourselves in these numbers and, and realizing the importance of adding context and qualitative aspects to make this data truly representative of ourselves. So over 52 weeks, we map our envies and what the feeling triggered in us. We map our desires, our emotions, and many more, creating these intimate portraits of ourselves to share with the other person through this invisible layer of data. And I guess you start seeing what I mean by the data we don't see. In this case, data that are much more interesting in than, than what we usually associate with personal data collections, such as the number of steps, expenses better, or patterns of calories intake. I bet it, like all of you have seen these charts on your phone, uh, you know, pretty often, but there's much more that we can explore. And this is true for small and big data, for personal data and beyond. Dear Data has become a book that is in its third edition, and the original collection of postcards that found the most exciting home and they've been um, acquired as part of the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, which is quite nice. But what excites us even more is that Dear Data has been so well received from the public outside the data community. We have seen thousands of postcards made by people who are not even designer or artists who learned about the project and really wanted to experiment on themselves. And even teachers of any grade are using this format to teach their students the world of data. So with this example, you've seen how we can turn even the smallest details of our lives into data that we can look at to see things from a different perspective. But besides personal data, we can do this anywhere. I'm often asked, where do you find data? And I reply lately more and more that I often design my data set. And I'll explain with this other example. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had the honor to collaborate with Paola Antonelli. She's the senior curator for design and architecture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York um, on a piece that closed the, the show that was called Items, Is Fashion Modern? That was a show that explored our deep relationship with society and culture through fashion. So the show presented 111 items of clothing, clothes and accessories that have had, that have had a strong impact and influence on our culture from the bikini to the burkini, from the Patagonia fleece jacket to the balclava. And I've had the great opportunity to create a site-specific 
hand-drawn after the data visualization to guide visitors to explain the features of the items, both individually and as part of a bigger ecosystem. But what is interesting here is that I didn't have any data. I only had like a pile of paper, like, you know, the list of the 111 objects and the background research that the curatorial team conducted on each of them. And so I put on the glasses of the data collector and I delved into these 111 stories in search for bits of quantitative and qualitative information that could help me answer a few main questions, really to understand and reveal why was each of the items included in the show. And the questions that I asked to build my data set were, for example, is the item a medium or a message? Meaning, is it iconic because of its technical and aesthetical features or for what it represents? And for example, are they worn to conform to a movement or to escape to a movement? Meaning, has it become a way to blend into a social context or to break free from it? And many more of these kind, like crafting the data sets from these questions, where the data were absolutely not in this form that you see here before this analog process. And then each one of the items became a symbol that I drew on the wall, positioned and visualized according to this set of attributes that I built together with the curators with the legend on the left side wall to interpret it. And the whole point of my exercise was to start from the final manifestation of this process in the mind of the curator and work backwards. So really reconstructing what I think it is an invisible data set that Paola and her team used as an input for their you know, exhibition, even without knowing that. And then making it visible for everyone to see through the lens of data, something that, you know, to me, it's incredibly valuable. And in similar situations, we don't see these invisible layers that can help us understand phenomena better. First of all, because we don't observe these more qualitative and human types of data, but also because nobody really designs carefully experiences to reveal them, to elevate them, even though when they were present all along. And really the design of the experience, it's, it's really important. And you'll see what I mean with a few other examples. So in 2017, the organizer of the TED conference came to us before the, the edition in Vancouver uh, with a challenging brief. How can we use data from the participants of the conference, so the attendees, like you guys are at the conference, to give something valuable back to them? So, you know, initially we imagined to create an installation on a big wall where we could use an algorithm to match participants with a similar profile, you know, such as job position, where they were from. But then ultimately we asked ourselves, in what way would this data be meaningful? And once more, we decided to look for data in less obvious places, and we created what we called data portraits of all the people we are at TED. So images based on people answers to a series of questions that then were translated into a unique data-driven image where every color and symbol and position of the elements that you're seeing is the direct representation and translation of one person's answer. And images that were then immediately printed on buttons that people would wear throughout the conference and use as a tool for sparking conversations and finding commonality with others. So as you can read on the right, this is the legend, we ask everybody simple but evocative questions such as which TED letter are you, technology, entertainment or design? Uh, and do you get your best ideas after an adult beverage or while at work? How messy is your desk? And how many unread emails in your inbox before you freak out? And people at TED were wearing their abstract symbol on their badges, and they will use them to identify similarities and differences with other people at the conference at a first glance, like really an excuse to introduce themselves and an icebreaker to start a conversation that was much more meaningful than say, hey, I'm Georgia, I'm, I'm a designer, what do you do? So we've been working here with soft and definitely small data, data that were not present all along, uh, that in this case, I think proved to be more meaningful than anything we could have gathered digitally or automatically. We replicated this idea of the data portrait at a few other events, always accompanying it with the legend. And finally, we recently turned this concept into a completely interactive and collective installation at the Museum of the City of New York. It's part of a show called Who We Are, Visualizing New York by the Numbers, an exhibition that was opened in anticipation of the 20th, 20th census that highlights the importance of the census. And we've been created, we've been invited to create an original piece to contribute to the show, thinking about our identity and what matters to be counted. So we called it What Counts, um, and it has two core components, a large projection on the gallery wall and an interactive iPad interface in the middle of the space. So as they walk by, visitors can answer a short questionnaire on the iPad about themselves and their identity. 
for example, here are some of the questions. If you had to pick only one, which of the following best describes you? Compared to other, I believe I am completely unique, unique in most way. See that. Um, if you had to pick only one, which of the following is most important to you? So really trying to describe ourselves in this, you know, limited in any way, um, multiple choices um, option. Then how do you personally define home as opposed to what is the zip code that you live into? Um, uh, do you feel that you currently have enough? Um, and also this one is about what you will hope the next generation will enjoy better than you. And finally, is the future brighter grim? So as you might have guessed, then a unique visual symbol is generated on the iPad as you move through the survey. So a data portrait that represent the combination of your unique answers to these kind of speculative questions. And so once the survey is completed, you can physically swipe your data portrait to the gallery wall, where it will join this animated projection of all the data portrait collected since the beginning. So your portrait is contributing to the dynamic graphic on the wall and of course we conceived and ideated the questions as a provoking response to the questions that are asked in the census that are pretty much only demographical information, inviting us to think about how do we want it to be counted and what matter the most to count about us. Um, and then we intentionally designed the data portraits as hand-drawn and imperfect, contrasting with the clinical charts that are typically used to visualize census data. Well, then, as you've seen in the preview, in the projection, each element is also, or the portrait is also visually unpacked and explained so that we're also revealing the singular responses to each question. So how many people who participated clustered around a specific question? Of course, the legend is close to the projection to interpret what you're seeing um, and to be reminded of the collective experience. After you leave, you can print your unique data portrait on a button to take home and wear. Um, of course, they're who to a legend. And so the installation continued to collect data throughout the months before it closed for the pandemic. And in this case, also creating the ongoing visual record of the visitors of the museum, if you think about it. All right, so this other experience that I want to share before a final project, so there's one project and then another one, um, is something that we probably all can relate to, and it deals with information on the medical field. So this project is a collaboration with my dear friend and guitar player Kaki King. Um, two years ago, Kaki's three years old daughter Cooper was diagnosed with a condition called ITP, an autoimmune disease that actually where her body attacks her platelets and leads to spontaneous bruises, uh, bursts, blood vessels called petechia all over her body and in the most terrifying cases, even internal bleeding. So for four months, we collected and combined quantitative data from her daughter's test and qualitative observations from Kaki. So data from her life, her whole level of stress, the main conditions that happened. And she decided, and then we decided to share this very personal journey, not with words, but through this data. Then I visualized in a way that you wouldn't probably expect, normally expect from medical data. So these data are intimate and very intense and personal. And so I asked myself, can a data visualization evoke empathy and activate us also at an emotional level and not only at a cognitive one? So I started to structure a fluid timeline to tell the story of these four very hard months. Um, every symbol you see here represents a data point. Every white petal is a day. The rhythm is broken every time that Cooper was in the hospital to check her platelets count and the bursts of red dots represent this value. And then we have data as observed by Kaki herself, uh, like the purple splotches to represent the visible bruises and their intensity on Cooper's skin, and the pink dots for the petechia, so the blood marks on her skin and how spread out they were every day. So we're definitely here looking for days that are white without uh, splotches to see that Cooper was doing better. Um, when Cooper was taking medications, you'll see the gray shapes on the day. And here's where Cooper had some incident that caused her skin to worsen. But there's also all, and I'm zooming back and forth to get you to, to, to make you see how the buildup of the visualization works. But there's also all that was going on in Kaki's life and in her mind. So Kaki tours a lot and she felt very stressed when she was away from home. Uh, and that else, these are these black um, dots are the days that she was gone. In these dark moments, there have also been positive moments, such as a fun birthday party for Cooper and her brother, or a Halloween night um, that I represented with these bright yellow spots that cheer up the visual in a way. 
And lastly, Kaki also kept track of her home level of hope uh, and fear from one to 10 uh, on both emotions that I represented as these floating lines. Um, the dark lines are the fears and the orange lines are your hopes. And all around, we added Kaki's personal notes for each day. Um, so this is the final visualization of these four months, but there's more. This visual was used in a musical score by Kaki to create a piece that she composed directly from the four months of data collection, used where the timing of the song represent what was happening in their life exactly as the visualization. And I will play for you now a part of this song, and I'm inviting you to just pause and see if you can feel something through data. <laughs> As you can probably see, this is not by any means a scientific representation of data. Um, still, I think it paints a pretty complete and very sensorial picture of this personal journey. And many people living similar experiences told us that the visualization made them really feel part of Kaki's story in a way that probably a blog post wouldn't have. And I don't want to say that this can lead to any scientific breakthrough in the medical field. This is not the point of my work. But once more, there's a world of unexplored, small, intimate data that we often don't see if we apply a straightforward definition of what we think the data is. And a layer that also we don't see because visualizations often focus on the numbers and not on what the numbers represent. And you know, many of you are wondering, Cooper is absolutely fine now. She's out of the danger zone. She's healthy and thriving and she says hi. So, you know, it's ending with a positive note. Uh, and I will definitely end with a lighter note. This last example is possibly the most exciting project I've worked on. Um, and for the sake of time, I know that we're running out. It'll be, I'll be kind of quick. Uh, it's a fashion collection that I designed for the fashion brand and other stories, which is part of the H&M group. It's a data-driven collection uh, that was out last November in stores with the graphic patterns that are printed and rotted and sawed in the, uh, in the, pad in the codes are the direct representation of, I think, very human data points. Um, um, in fact, I went and looked for data into the achievement of what I think is three unprecedented women who have been pioneers in previously male-dominated field and who paved the ground for other women to start and try. Uh, the three women are Ada Lovelace, Rachel Carson, and Mae Jemison. And at this point, you understand what I do. Normally, uh, I craft a data set, uh, starting from their stories of their lives. Uh, and in this case, I craft a data set on their major accomplishments, so their achievement, and then background information on their life. So data that, of course, then I used to create the patterns, hopefully beautiful patterns that you would wear, um, but also that have a deep meaning behind it. So the first woman, Ada Lovelace, she was born in 1815. She's considered now to be the first computer programmer in history. Uh, it was the first time that somebody programmed a machine to do complex math, really as a matter of fact, originated in the discipline of computer science. I analyzed and visualized the structure and the mathematical form of the algorithm that she wrote. And in parallel, I was looking for visual inspiration in pieces of art that could reflect the nature of the data that I was working with, like geometric, repetitive, but with variations. And I started to sketch different ways in which each one of the 36 steps and its variables could be represented. Starting also to sketch how to display them on a piece of garment 
And this is the selected option with vertical elements, one for each of the 36 step of the algorithm. And you start seeing how the repetition form an interesting visual model. So I will not go into detail, but each one of these 36 line um, uh, of ADA al algorithm is one element with internal dividers that you'll see representing their variables. And here's the legend for myself, uh, every symbol, color, and divider, of course, represents data point in uh, the algorithm. And this is the final pattern for Ada, where everything, given just the positioning up and down as a function from her um, you know, mathematical script. And then the pattern will leave into the silhouettes that we designed together with the fashion team. And here I started to craft ideas on how to place them all over or just in particular spots on a sweater um, or even more creative placements on a shirt. And these are the final pieces, which I think are quite nice. And you can start seeing how, yes, the pattern is the one. And so we're talking about Ada's algorithm, but depending, of course, and this is, again, is a much more creative project, uh, depending on the silhouettes of uh, the garments, uh, it can be really placed in different ways. Um, as part of the process, there have been a lot of back and forth of testing, design, and sending me samples, which I really liked. And really very important as part of the shooting for the publicity. So everything that came out of their communication team, a beautiful model Nikita was posing as I recreated the legend behind her. So yet one more way to show customers, potential customers and people that are interested that there's a deep meaning behind what they're wearing. Uh, and then the process got repeated from the other women. Rachel Carson is the first environmental activist uh, and her book, Selling Spring, published in 1962, is the classic that launched the environmental movement. Um, here I went and looked for data in the structure of the content of the book. Um, in this case, building my visual inspiration around more organic shape as she you know, talked about environment and nature. These are some of the first sketches where every element in my idea could be a chapter of Rachel's book. Um, here I build a pattern. Every radial element is one of the 17 chapters. Uh, the lines are the number of paragraphs and their lengths. And building on top of it, I look into the whole book to see what were the nouns and adjectives that she mentioned the most. Zooming in for you to see. And then I looked into how much they've been mentioned per each chapter building the final pattern with the lengths of the different colored line, um, playing with different background colors. These are the final silhouettes and you know, you get the point, placing patterns in a different way as I did with Ada, getting bolder with the sweater um, and even thinking about like a wetsuit that then became a body. And here we go with the final pieces that are quite nice. And again, you can see how, of course, they belong to the same family of, you know, visualization and story, but, you know, they have different, different acts and depending on the, on the garments. Uh, samples back and forth, they did a great job with the details of the embroiders and the model wearing them for the shooting. Finally, Mae Jemison, born in 1967, she's still alive. Uh, she has been the first African-American woman astronaut. And for her, I visualized the orbits of her 1992 space shuttle mission, taking visual inspiration from circular pattern, re reconnecting the idea of orbits, sketching the orbits possible feature and finding landing on this version where one circle is one orbit, we will have 126 of them. So this is a final pattern. Um, and um, yeah, the symbols above represent which day she orbited around Earth in September 1992. And uh, the actually, we get back to the pattern. Uh, the color shadow represent the time of the day for the orbit. So really, in a way, a homage to the color of the sky as she, um, you know, could have seen from above. And then I also visualized in the background all the experiments that she performed in space, such as zero gravity, the retransmissions, and again, elements of the collection um, as we thought of them possible placements, a shirt, and there they are. So again, once more, uh, one pattern and that can be kind of like, you know, um, can have different type of applications. With an extra puffer for the winter and Nikita wearing them with the legend. Um, then for each woman, we also designed a t-shirt where we extracted only one element of the pattern as a bold signature 
And finally, when customer bought any of the garment in stores, they got a paper bag that I designed containing the pattern and the legend. So how to interpret what's in the texture, which is again, is always for me such a crucial point of my work. And I always like to say that I know that probably not everybody will nerd out dissecting Ada's algorithm from this paper bag, but at least they will really know that what they're wearing have a real deep meaning. So to conclude, what excites me about this project and why I wanted to conclude with that is that for me, this is another step further to demystify data. For example, I see this specific project as one of the possible evolution to the graphic t-shirt with a written message. So in this case, the fabric itself becomes the message where every feature of a garment can possibly be deep, deeply connected with information and messages that we are proud to carry around with us. And I'm particularly interested uh, in this less conventional, but perhaps more popular project with data for their potential to reach a wider audience that might start thinking about data in a different way. And for the opportunity to discover and reveal the human side of data, which is of course what mattered most. So over the years, I build my approach and practice around what I call data humanism, which to me always means designing ways to reconnect numbers to what they stand for, which are our ideas and unexplored and open questions about ourselves and our society. And then through design, making this new knowledge available for everyone to access and engage with. And I'm really excited about the possibilities opened up with this way, by this way of looking at data, especially in this very moment in time. And uh, I hope you are too. So thank you for now. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Giorgio Lupi. I think uh, I finished all my Italian words for today. <laughs> uh, can you see me? Is it okay? We can see you fine, just fine. Um, let's take a couple of questions from the audience if we have any. We have a question in the back if we can uh, give her a microphone. How many people are you guys there? I'm just curious. Millions. Millions. <laughs> Hello, Georgia, and welcome to Ethra. Thank you so much. It's nice to meet you. What's your name? My name is Mi'ad. I'm a graphic designer. Hi, Mi'ad. Uh, I was also in your master class this uh, afternoon. Good okay, so inspiration. <laughs> Thank you. So now you've seen everything twice. <laughs> yes. Uh, so my question is, uh, when we get a client, we always uh, want to explore with this kind of project data visualization. Uh, the only obstacle, we, uh, we also fa face two obstacles. First is time. Uh, usually, data is created by different organization, maybe the same organization, but a different team. And they um, sometimes deliver the data late, maybe weeks or sometimes days before the finishing of the project. Yeah. We don't have the luxury of time of doing all this work, amazing work, and sometimes we jump to like this basic data visualization, like chart or stuff like that. The other obstacle, or the second obstacle always, uh, is the, the client it's, uh, himself. Um, when we pitch an idea like this, and we show him or her uh, some of your work or uh, other designers, they, they are on board, they get excited. Yeah, this is very cool. But when we start de delivering like the first draft or the second draft, we lose them into this is too hard to understand or abstract or this is too artistic, no one can understand it, let's, let's add a graph. Let's add uh, uh, a chart to, to explain. Let's add a video to explain. They don't understand like the idea of data visualization, this artistic piece. It will stay for, for, for a long time. I see. So uh, that's a bunch of ways that we can go about this answer. I think that like, in general, more and more, um, we will 
we, and I, I hear myself twice, so it's a little confused. No, no, it's fine. Thank you. Um, so um, we will we will more and more be a data literate society, and so I think that like more and more we will see less of a barrier and an obstacle in the way the clients react to data, because I believe that in the next few years data will become a language that everybody will learn how to speak. Um, then I, to be completely honest, I think that I am a little lucky because for the body of work that I produced, if a client comes to me, they sort of like already know that they want to work with data in my way. And so I have the luxury to um, put together timelines for them and milestone and processes where, you know, either there is some buffer time between the final data and the delivery of the project, or I cannot really ensure the quality of the work. There's a bunch of things that one can do though. So sometimes in the beginning you can really work with I would say realistic data, but not real data. So you can still think about, you know, how you want to, and it's very abstract and it's very vague now because we don't have a specific example, but you can still think about how do you want to really shape the experience and you can work with data as they get pulled. And so I think the best way is to be agile and flexible and work with data, even if they are not the final data set and then leave a buffer in the end for the finalizations, because there's a lot that you can hunch and guess, even if you don't have the up-to-date numbers, right? So there's one thing to do. Um, in general, how do you convince clients to work with data? I think one thing that I always like to say is that data is the most contemporary material that we have. And even if you are an organization that don't think of themselves as data-driven, for sure, whatever organization you have, you either have data that you monitor about your organization, your customers, but also imagine and other stories. You also can have stories and messages that you want to proudly explore without necessarily having data. And then the data design process is really what helps, um, you know, seeing everything through the lens of data. So um, I would say also that data visualization in this way is a kind of like almost new way of communicating. And so we are at the forefront and there will be some obstacle. There will be some clients that say, no, this is not for me. Uh, I think it's just okay to keep trying and it'll be easier and easier, I hope. Thank you, Georgia. We have one more question here from the screen. So it says, tell us about the service you sold to Google and what data-related services can someone sell to a company? The, the service I sold to Google? What is the question about? It says I, we did a speculative project for Google that was a augmented reality application, but it's, it was completely speculative for the Google Newsroom Lab. So I'm not really sure they understand the question. I'll be happy to answer if it gets clarified. Fair enough. We'll jump into the last question. It says, data is the new oil. What would you comment on that? I think data is, new, is the new oil is something that was, um, it has been said for a long period of time. I think it's important though to, I think I'd like to conclude with this premise. Yes, data can be the new oil because we have data everywhere and everything can be based on data. But at the same time, we always need to remember that data is not reality. Data is never objective because even if it comes from a sensor, a human being designed the sensor and decided what to collect and what to leave out. So it's really important to always remember that having data is absolutely better than not having data, but data is always subject to an interpretation. And so if you adopt that premise, well, I think the data then becomes a very powerful tool for monitoring certain processes, for communicating certain dynamics, um, but really, really always thinking about the fact that data is not a abstract thing that is already there. Data is primarily human made, and this is why I think that focusing on the human aspect of data can unlock uh, potentials for from now on. That's a very good point to conclude our talk today. Thank you very much, uh, Georgia Lupi. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. It was such a pleasure. Always oh, nice to see you from the window now. <laughs> Thank you. Arrivederci. Bye. Arrivederci.